Hey fellow explorers, this past week I attended a travel industry conference in California put on by California travel industry for the California travel industry and they were sharing a lot of interesting insights about the recovery of the travel industry in the USA. Have we recovered? Haven't we recovered? And so I, saw, I thought, listening to this myself uh, as a fly on the wall, I thought I would share some of this these interesting insights with y'all today. And when we talk about the U.S. travel industry recovering, I mean, it's a big industry. It is a $1.1 trillion industry in the USA. We're talking not just about airlines and hotels, but we're talking about theme parks and cruise lines and rental cars and casinos. And so there's a lot of things that make up travel that we're going to go through as we go through this video. Uh, and so First, I want to start with just like <clears throat> number of travelers coming to the USA. And so let's first start by talking about domestic travel. And you know, when we, particularly like if you're in the USA and you go to some place like Las Vegas, you might say travel has 100% recovered because there's so many people in Las Vegas. There's so many people at Disneyland. Um, or if you're in some place like Monterey, which is where this conference was held and Monterey has a ton of sea lions, you might say, like there's a lot of people here, so travel looks great. Uh, domestic travel within the USA is 99% recovered to 2019 levels, which means people within the USA are traveling just like they did about three years ago. Um, but uh, why is that? Well, COVID caused a big spike in leisure travel, but now a lot of people that they've had their like revenge on COVID and they've gotten their big vacations out, the leisure travel is starting to spike down again. Also in the USA, the smaller cities have a lot of tourism going to them, uh, but the bigger cities, not so much. Um, California, has fared pretty well in all of this, where California has actually been the number one destination state in the USA currently. Uh, and also, if you're looking to do a road trip, which was pretty popular during COVID, California is the number one road trip state in the USA. All right, now going past domestic travel, it's not all as rosy. If we talk about business travel, business travel to the USA is to the USA and within the USA is only 77% recovered. Uh, and so small and medium sized companies, they are traveling again and maybe even more than they were before, but large companies, uh, particularly like the Silicon Valley tech companies, they're not traveling uh, at all like they used to, maybe even at all, you know, with the rise of Zoom and virtual meetings, a lot of big industries still have not opened up those purse strings of their travel budgets. Where it goes down even more is group travel. Group travel is only 69% recovered. Um, so we're not seeing as many people in the tour groups and the tour buses in the USA. And by the way, what's this picture? <laughs> this picture is of the gigantic group of sea lions that live in Monterey, where I was last week when I went to this conference. And I've never seen so many sea lions sitting in one place. They actually like, they sleep on each other. It's kind of funny um, how they do that. And like jockey for like the topmost sunny position. I think it's pretty funny. Uh, but then the fourth area of travel that is the least recovered is international travel. International travel to the USA is only 55% recovered. So basically in 2023, only half as many people from outside the US came here as they did in 2019. Uh, what are the countries that travel is most down from inbound to the USA? Uh, the United Kingdom, Japan, China, Korea, and Brazil. Uh, Brazil, interestingly enough, made the top five. Uh, and so why, why is that? Why are international folks not coming to the USA as much as they used to? And uh, we'll point to a few reasons. One is cost. Cost is certainly up. Cost of travel into the USA and around the USA is at least 20% higher now than it was in 2019. And the travel experts, um, the ec economic experts, you know, tend to consider travel prices are likely not going to get any better in 2024 to expect the demand and likely the prices to remain steady. Uh, ben also says the currency is terrible for visitors, uh, particularly if you're using the circus circus currency, uh, which is what that coin is right there at Las Vegas. Um, 
And uh, Points Traveler points out about hotels saying that he was in St. Louis last week. Hard to find a room. Yeah, and I think St. Louis is one of those, St. Louis, Missouri, um, famous for their ribs, one of those like local destinations where a lot of locals are traveling there, not a lot of international people. And so I'm also going to talk about if you are coming to the U.S. or traveling within the U.S., where do you want to go to try to get a good deal? Because although some destinations prices are up and up significantly, some destinations prices are down and down significantly too. Uh, another reason why maybe less people are coming to the USA is because they hear about the overcrowding in a lot of tourist destinations, particularly in the national parks. Uh, you know, when people couldn't go into big cities, where do they flock to? They flock to the great outdoors and in the national parks. Uh, and some national parks have put in place reservation systems. The good news is that some national parks, like uh, Zion National Park in Utah, that put in place a reservation system to ride their shuttle has now taken that reservation system away. Uh, but if you are going to a national park, you want to check to see if you need a reservation or not to get in, get a ticket, ride a shuttle, um, book your hotels. Um, you know, Disneyland requires you to like make a reservation for like the day you're going, where they you never did before. And so uh, the USA has definitely kind of become a reservation destination where before I feel like it was a very much like turn up and show up wherever you want sort of destination. I will say, though, that I feel like the overcrowding in national parks is kind of overblown because I think people have been talking in the last hundred years about the national parks being too crowded because people who look for nature just don't want other people around them. Uh, I think you're going to find plenty of space if you do go to the national parks if you just get yourself like five minutes off the main road or five minutes off of the main like touristy viewpoints. Uh, Canyon Overlook says Zion has become too popular, too many TV ads, you know, and I, you know, maybe in the summer it is. I would just encourage you to go in the winter. Maybe it's a little cold uh, and uh, I think you'll find it. Uh, you might not have the park all to yourself, uh, but there will definitely be way less people there. Uh, and Min says, I was just in Zion a couple months ago and Brandon says, we have plenty of national parks in the USA. Yeah, there's a few big ones and there's a few lesser known ones, so you can absolutely visit some of those too. Um, now let's talk about the air travel experience. I think another reason why we're seeing less people come to the USA is certainly there are less flights, less international flights into and out of the USA than there were before, particularly if we look at destinations like Japan and China and Korea, where the airlines just haven't restored the same level of flights as there used to be. The flights are also more expensive, uh, and the flights that are there uh, are like really getting significantly delayed. This right here was the flight board uh, that I was looking at when I was coming back home from uh, the Monterey area last week. I was flying from San Jose back to my home airport in Orange County. And uh, if you know your arrivals board, and if you look at this board, look at how many of those are delayed. Like, almost almost everything on that um, board is delayed. And San Jose doesn't have bad weather. That's just like the state of affairs of air travel right now. Actually, the, the true statistic is much better than this board. This true t statistic is that 25% of all flights in 2023 in the USA were either delayed or canceled uh, and so um, you know, I, I also found uh, this new sign uh, to be interesting. Prior to boarding, Southwest had this sign that says, per FAA regulation, we just want to let you know that Southwest will deny boarding to its aircraft if a passenger appears to be intoxicated. And I think that like, tr like frustration with air travel is at like an all-time high. Passengers are angrier. Maybe they get even drunker. Um, and... You know, there haven't been like a lot of, uh, I think, like solutions to figure out like, okay, how do we start to make it better again? You know, I think it all really started with like the mask arguments on planes, which luckily we don't have those anymore. Um, but uh, what you will see coming to the USA is a lot of airlines experimenting with like biometric boarding. Um, when we went to... Uh, let's see, where was I flying? I was flying to Singapore. When I was flying to Singapore and I was boarding United, I didn't have to show my boarding pass. All I did was I showed up to kind of like, it looked like an iPad and I looked into it and it went boom. 
welcome onto the plane. <laughs> and uh, Points Traveler says, if you're flying southwest, intoxicated is the only way to fly. You know, that's a, that's a very interesting perspective. Uh, and uh, Laurel says, go southwest. Yeah, southwest air time, I mean, didn't really have the best uh, last year around the holidays when they melted down and like canceled all their flights for three weeks. Um, and uh, yeah, Southwest uh, in particular also has a lot of delayed flights. James says JFK Airport is like a cattle market, not a great place to land and get through in a hurry. Yeah, and I think this is a, like a like a U.S. travel experience thing, and the lens of many Americans on um, the airport experience uh, is that many Americans will say that. Airports, they're not supposed to be a place where you like enjoy being there. They're supposed to be places that are efficient to get you from point A to point B. Uh, and so these people disagree with my video about LAX Airport, why everyone hates LAX Airport. And they say, Chris, it's only you that hates LAX Airport. I don't hate LAX Airport. I, I like LAX Airport. That's the big airport in Los Angeles. And I say to these people, you've apparently never been to Singapore Airport, which is amazing. Our airports could be so much more amazing if we didn't just think about them as places to like glorified greyhound stations that take things on wings, uh, but places that people might even want to come even if they're not flying, which in the case of Singapore airports, people go hang out at that airport even if they're not taking a flight. Um, I think that's amazing. And Brandon says, Chris, there are worse airports than LAX. There are way worse airports than LAX, but uh, many people know about LAX, so uh, that's why I use that one. All right. What are other reasons that international travelers might not be coming to the USA? Um, well, if you're coming from a country and you need to get a visitor visa to the USA, you might have to wait a long time. The statistic uh, that was tossed out at the conference was for visitors from China. The current wait to get a visa is 400 days. <laughs> That's a Boy, you got to be really dedicated to wait 400 days. Uh, but even internally to the US, for someone in the US to get a passport to leave the US, the wait for a passport right now is 10 to 13 weeks. So like three, four months to get a passport. If you're applying for global entry, which is the program to like get you expedited entry into the US, so you don't have to wait in the passport lines, the wait often for interviews for global entry can be four to six months. Um, and of course, long waits at the TSA checkpoints and long waits at the Customs and Border Patrol checkpoints, at the land borders. And I think something I hear a lot also is that people are worried about their safety when they come to the USA. And I don't think, I mean, I think this is something that like COVID exacerbated the homeless issues in the USA, which just makes it like obvious that there's some of these issues. You may have watched my video recently about uh, is Los Angeles safe for visitors, where I talk about all of the issues in Venice Beach. Um, but, uh, you know, I think we find that like this homelessness issue being at an all-time high, all the politicians are talking about it, but none of the solutions seem to be solving it or they haven't like, or the funding that's allocated hasn't like really materialized or it takes a while. Um, but it's not just California that has homeless issues. I mean, I was talking to some people that were in Salt Lake City in Utah recently, which is a really cold place in the winter. Um, and they said they even saw a lot of homeless people in Salt Lake City. So you're going to find it, um, unfortunately, spread out across the USA. You know, some of the issues we have is that we can't, many of the laws in the USA don't um, allow the government to force people into mental health treatment. But at the same time, people don't want them out in the streets, and those two things tend to be incompatible. Um, but I think this also like affects people's decisions on where to travel. Do they travel to Los Angeles or New York City, or do they go to Tokyo, where they don't have to worry about that? Let's talk about uh, hotels. Uh, and so hotels, have hotels recovered as an industry? Um, and some have, uh, you know, we heard it was hard to find a hotel in St. Louis. Um, but in general, for many hotels, uh, this metric that they track is rev par, revenue per available room. So at many hotels across the USA, rev par is up, particularly at luxury hotels. Luxury hotels are making more money in the USA than they ever have because 
leisure travel is up and with people are traveling for leisure, they're willing to spend some extra money for something nice um, as opposed to maybe when they're on business travel and they're not in their room all that much and so they're like, well, I don't need something that nice, um, which has led to higher room rates, particularly in resort type destinations, small town destinations, beach destinations, destinations to national parks. That's where you're gonna find our most expensive on the west coast of the U.S., uh, and this, I guess, isn't the coast, but the western states uh, of the big cities, the city where hotel room RevPAR, the revenue per available room, is up the most is Phoenix. Hotels in Phoenix are up 40% from what they were in 2019. Orange County, California, where I live, home to Disneyland, prices are up 20%. Um, where are they down? Hotel prices are down in what they call the gateway cities. What are gateway cities? Gateway cities, they're called gateways because they're where international travelers come in. Los Angeles, Seattle, uh, San Francisco, Portland, Oakland, San Jose, uh, those are many of our big gateway cities and uh, they're down significantly. Um, in particular, the one that's like the three that are down the most, the San Francisco Bay Area, San Jose, Oakland, San Francisco, their hotel rates were bolstered a ton by business travel of all the big Silicon Valley tech firms, which would spend exorbitant amounts of money for a courtyard hotel. I mean, I remember going to like San Jose once and spending, you know, $400 a night to stay at a courtyard Marriott that was by the freeway. Um, and that now, you know, that's a uh, that's hundred bucks because nobody's going to visit uh, the offices of Facebook anymore. Um, I'm thirsty. What am I drinking today? Wow. wow. This is a very interesting drink. This is the first time I've had this. This is um, Juicy Lychee and Okinawa Sea Salt. A refreshing drink for the heat. Uh, made in Japan by Kieran. And it has a really um, strong lychee flavor. I don't taste the salt all that much, but it's pretty good. And it says it only has 34 calories. I wonder if I believe that. <laughs> oh, no, no, it's funny. It has 34 calories, but there's five servings in this container. So there's 150 calories in there. Um, you know, something that we talk a lot about in California uh, back on San Francisco and the hotel prices being cheap and travel and all that stuff. Uh, as we're not talking about the whole San Francisco area, but now I'm talking about the city of San Francisco right now. The question is, is San Francisco in a doom loop? What's the doom loop? Well, the doom loop in San Francisco, or when people talk about it, the doom loop is um, all of the people who work there don't go to San Francisco anymore because they now work from home. So because they work from home, then the businesses that would cater to all those people that would go there, well, they're going out of business, uh, which then means that there's more vacant stores, which means that there's more crime, which means that less tourists go to San Francisco, which means that the tourist businesses close, which means that the other businesses close, and which means that San Francisco is in this doom loop where it's just going to get worse and worse and worse. Um, and like police staffing is down. Uh, and like you wonder, is has San Francisco become like Gotham City now? I mean, San Francisco does have the um, highest rate of car break-ins in the USA. Uh, I guess the good news is that I think at this point, the San Francisco city government has like, uh, is is wise to it to be like we can't keep going on this level uh, and so the city leadership there they're actually like looking at a whole new reimagination of downtown San Francisco and I think what like what really happened was San Francisco was super dependent upon one industry they were super dependent on the tech sector and when the tech sector left or decided they don't need to come to work anymore it just made San Francisco lose that vibrancy that was a part of it. And so they're like, they're trying to reimagine what downtown San Francisco looks like. Um, and I think as part of that reimagination, we've like Ikea, the big blue building that sells um, furniture and Swedish meatballs, they just opened a location in downtown San Francisco. I mean, that like that never would have opened four years ago when everything was so expensive and this and that, but now they can, you know, get, get big locations cheap. So I think, I think we'll see 
more housing filling in to where some of these big tech office buildings used to be uh, and hopefully give San Francisco a uh, resurgence. Carmen says San Francisco is sad now. I hope they get it together. I never thought San Francisco would be in worse shape than LA, but it is. Uh, and Carmen, I agree with you. If you watched my video about is uh, LA safe to visit for visitors, uh, my thesis at the end was with all of LA's issues, it's still safer than San Francisco. Um, you know, and I know there are certainly people who like may argue with me on this to be like, Chris, I went to San Francisco and I felt completely safe. And I was like, maybe just hung out on Pier 39, which was like the manufactured tourist area. But like, if you go visit, you know, um, like their uh, Union Square, Market Street, things like that, like there's, hmm, yeah, there's some parts of San Francisco that uh, really, really need some revibrancy. Vic says San Francisco has become an embarrassment. And Brooklyn Joe says, Ikea can open because nobody can steal something that they have to assemble. That's true, right? I think that's why Ikea can open there because it's really hard to steal um, unassembled furniture. You know, it's not, not worth much to resell um, unassembled furniture. Now, uh, something I heard earlier was about resort fees. So let's talk about this now. Uh, this is something, um, you know, people always ask me about, Chris, what are resort fees when I come to the USA? Or what about these fees? Or what about taxes? And so travel in the USA has definitely become a land of fees where like whatever you see as an advertised price, you'd expect to pay more. Uh, certainly tax is almost never advertised in prices. And so you're gonna need to pay, you know, somewhere between eight to 10% more than the advertised price because you gotta pay tax. Uh, if you're at a restaurant, you got a tip. Uh, many restaurants now um, charge service charges. Uh, at my favorite dim sum restaurant in the San Francisco area, they now add a mandatory 18% service charge. And then they ask you if you want to tip more money. And of course, for me, the answer is no. By the time you charge me an 18% service charge, I don't feel compelled to tip and neither should you. Uh, but hotels continue to charge these resort fees or destination fees or whatever fee they call it, which is some fee on top of the room rate. Uh, and there was actually like a lawsuit in the USA, which now requires um, both airlines and hotels on like the main booking page to like show the full price that includes all of the fees. Um, but of course, the funny part about that is that uh, they don't have to show it in big font. And so what I'm seeing a lot is like in big font, they'll be like the room rate is $200. And then, you know, like in tiny little two point font, it says like, well, that's $292, including taxes and resort fees. So again, you might see a big, no, no, like a big low number because it's in big font and the small number that says the other thing. So you definitely have to pay attention uh, still to those extra fees. Uh, I mean, even we're seeing like where in the USA, you never really used to get charged a credit card surcharge for using your credit card. Uh, but now you get charged, some places will be like, oh, well, I charge you 4% to use a credit card. Okay, how much if I pay cash? Oh, it's 10% if you pay cash. I just get charged an extra fee one way or another. And I was like, yeah, there's just extra fees on everything. I, I was at a restaurant today for lunch and on their menu, they have prices for everything. And then down at the bottom of the menu, it says uh, there is a 4% uh, surcharge on all items to cover increased costs. I have an idea. How about we just make price more instead of like all these hidden surcharges. Um, and you know, for international visitors who don't, uh, who don't get it, they'll be like, Chris, I don't get it. For those of us in the USA, we don't, we don't get it either. We don't like this anymore. I also think the thing to be aware of, uh, I'm going to call it like the, the forced tipping culture, like more people are asking for tips than ever before in every sector. Uh, even at self checkouts, like you go to an airport and there's a gift shop and there's self checkout and you, you buy your drink in the self checkout, the self checkout will ask you if you want a tip who in the store that has nobody in it. Um, you order online on the Shake Shack app and the Shake Shack app adds a 10% tip by default. Like you can remove it, but there will be a lot of things that like will default have a tip. And if you don't want to tip, then you gotta like specifically check the box to be like, I don't want to tip. So don't, don't get caught in that uh, loop. Um, let's talk about rental cars for a moment. Uh, on the real rosy side for USA travel is the rental car prices have improved significantly. This was a huge issue 18 months ago where rental car prices were like 
super crazy insane. You couldn't get a rental car unless you sold your left kidney. Um, rental car prices are down to somewhat normal levels. They're not as cheap as they were in 2019, but they're also not like 500% more. Um, because they're still not the same inventory as before. There's, the rental car companies don't have nearly as many cars as they used to where they were just sitting around and they just needed to get them out of the parking lot. Um, but what's, what's uh, the big change is there's a huge push for electric cars. Uh, and when I picked up my rental car the other day at a San Jose airport down the Hertz President Circle choice aisle, there's 20 cars to pick from. Every single one of them was an electric car. Uh, and uh, I shared this uh, with a friend of mine today. I shared this story and she said uh, the last trip she took, she had the same experience where the only cars they had were electric cars. Uh, and so uh, brush up on your electric charging because you may find that the only cars available are electric cars. In my case, there were like, I just, I stood around and I waited for them to clean cars and then uh, a Ford Mustang came out that was an electric car, um, and so that's the one I took because I didn't I didn't know whether the hotel I was staying at would actually have electric charging, um, and uh, yeah, and so that's just I think the I like we're gonna get there eventually. We're like probably in the USA, every car you're gonna get eventually is just an electric car. Um, I recognize that that's like a world trend. It'll be a lot better when you know you can go to a hotel and actually plug your electric car in. Uh, as opposed to, you know, you're taking a trip to the Grand Canyon and you're like, where do I, where do I charge on the way? Um, yeah, and Valerian the Max is, where do you charge your, your electric car? Big problem right now with electric cars. Uh, it's probably fine if you're just like doing a quick city trip, going from the airport, going to your hotel, not driving enough that you need to charge it. But if you need to charge it a lot, uh, it's challenging. And Canyon Overlook says rental cars are stupid. Um, and Emmett says, I want my car to be burning some dinosaur blood. And let me tell you, that Ford Mustang that I got, that was burning some dinosaur blood. Vroom, vroom, vroom! All right. Uh, the other uh, thing about cars and why, like, coming to the USA, you might want to get a car now or maybe you didn't get a car before is uh, public transit infrastructure across the USA still suffering from lack of ridership, uh, particularly in a lot of big cities. Um, I hit the San Francisco issues. People aren't riding public transit in there. In Los Angeles, still not many people riding public transit. In New York City, some people are back on the subway, but not as many as there were before. So, um, you know, because of that, fares are down which means they don't have as money to pay people to maintain the public transit. They don't have as much money to pay for enforcement. They don't have as much money to pay for cleaning. Um, yeah, so uh, makes the case for the rental car. Um, and uh, Whistleblower says, hey, the reason why they give you the electric car is to track you uh, where you are at any time. I won't get into any conspiracy theories because I don't, I don't, I don't really know. Um, but you know, if they want to find out, I'm going to the dim sum restaurant for lunch. They can, they can knock themselves out. Okay. So another interesting trend about tourism in the USA since COVID is that some communities that were really touristy in 2019 enjoyed the lack of tourists during all the lockdowns. And now those communities, now the tourists are coming back and going like, I kind of liked it when nobody was here. Um, why? Well, because more people leads to more traffic, leads to less parking. Um, though, you know, I, I think that the people in any place that don't like tourism, that don't like tourists coming there, I think that they are typically the vocal minority. Uh, m most people agree that the pros of tourism outweigh the cons, um, but those very vocal, the very vocal minority, it's like in, in Hawaii, in Maui, and by the way, not the fire stuff that they're suffering with, like that was awful, but uh, the road to Hana, there's this famous drive in Maui called the road to Hana, and when Hawaii reopened the tourism, like residents were like blocking the road to Hana, be like, uh-uh, nobody can drive on this road, it's ours, it's like, is the road actually yours? I mean, the road's a state road, and there's freedom of move. It's a, it's a highway, and there's, I don't know if it's a federal highway, but there's federal highways in Hawaii. That one's probably not. But again, it's a public road. It's not your road. You didn't pay for it. It doesn't have your name on it. You don't own the land that that's on. Um, freedom of movement. We should be able to drive on the road, right? 
So the challenge then for like tourism boards is how do they promote tourism in a way that doesn't make the locals in a destin destination feel like they're making the destination worse for the people who actually live there. Um, yeah, Kathy points out Hawaii in general didn't like the tourists coming back. I mean, I think there's one where like, right, this is what we hear. We hear like, Hawaii didn't like the tourists coming back. I think it's the vocal minority that didn't like the tourists coming back. I think most people would say like, we like the tourists coming Because the number of people in Hawaii that work in the hospitality sector, I mean, like at the University of Hawaii, one of their biggest majors is like hospitality and tourism management. Like that's a, that's a big deal. So I think, again, more people uh, want them back. But the people that we hear the news coverage about are those three people that live on the road to Hana that blockade the road. And then people hear, oh, Hawaiians don't, you know, the people who live in Hawaii, they don't want us to go there. Um, Carmen says, I think most people wanted the tourist money. Yeah, right. In the end, right, the, the money from tourists is, is good, right? Like that's, that's why people want tourism. Like it's good for the community because people come here and they spend money. But I think with the challenges, and this isn't something happening in the USA, but like in Venice, Italy, you know, the challenge becomes when destinations have like tons and tons of visitors and then those visitors don't spend any money in the destination, right? Like people who would come to Venice, Italy, they'd come as a big group tour. Uh, they'd walk around, they'd see the sites. They wouldn't eat lunch. They wouldn't eat any meals. They'd come and they'd go. And it's like, well, in that case, I don't know. You use our sidewalks. You enjoy the view. Like with, other, with the city pays for all these things, but then the city doesn't benefit, which is why places like Venice are trying to institute like fees for the tourists to be like, well, at least we're going to get five bucks from you if you're coming here. Um, which, you know, like I find things like charging for parking or tolls to come in or this and that to, to me to not be awful. Oh, the reason why I have this picture up here. Uh, Newport, Rhode Island, a place I uh, recently did a video on and a place that I've been to a few times over the last 10 to 15 years, uh, recently has like really upped their game on pay parking. And what I mean by that is like in their downtown area, like every parking spot's a pay parking spot now. Um, and it's a pay parking spot like from 6 a.m. to midnight every day of the week, only during the summer, uh, like in the winter, they don't care because uh, in the winter, it's just the locals. But for the visitors who are coming, the city's going to make sure they get their money out of them because you need to park your car someplace. Hey, look, I'm okay with that. You know, they got to pave the roads. They got to pay for the parking lots. Um, so it's all good. I think another thing that a lot of uh, cities in the U.S. are wrestling with is now that people aren't taking their public transit as much anymore and are getting cars, how do they get people out of their cars and how do they get people back into public transit? Or how do they get people in like shuttles um, in Orange County where I live, the city of Laguna Beach, which is this beach town, super busy. Uh, Laguna Beach runs these free, they call them trolleys, but they're really like open air buses along Pacific Coast Highway. Uh, but it's like, and they're free. It's just like, just roll on board and you can ride this thing. Um, and I think like those sorts of things for towns, like I'm seeing more and more of that where towns or destinations are beginning to offer like free trolleys or free public transportation to get people around just to um, avoid the um, congestion that comes with people driving. And, you know, a lot of tourists are like, hey, if I can park my car once and not have to drive and see the sites, that actually uh, works works good for me. Brandon says Rhode Island is not a big state. Uh, and Alfredo says I was in Laguna Beach earlier today at the top of the world. We were just at top of the world last weekend hiking. So Alfredo, that is awesome. If you don't know what top of the world is in Laguna Beach, it's like the highest point in Laguna Beach. Um, it has amazing views of Orange County. If you head to Laguna Beach, definitely uh, head up there for a hike. We're also seeing a pushback on Airbnbs in smaller destinations, uh, particularly like mountain towns where, um, you know, half of the available properties have been turned into Airbnbs or vacation rentals. And now the local workforce no longer has any place to like live that's close by in the mountain towns. And so the people who actually have to work in the mountain towns have to live like an hour and a half away because they can't afford to live there anymore. Um, so a lot of municipalities are starting to really crack down on Airbnb uh, licensing, unauthorized Airbnbs. Um, but I think related to this lack of housing, you know, something that continues to plague the USA is um, la lack of workforce. There just, there don't seem to be as many people that want to work in the hospitality, 
hotel segments as there used to be, which leads hotels to do less housekeeping, less room cleaning. Um, don't expect daily housekeeping in your hotel in the USA. I mean, some, if you're in the luxury properties, you'll probably get it, but if you're staying in some of the lower-ended, cheaper properties, you know, you can expect them to either not provide housekeeping or provide housekeeping every four days. So if daily housekeeping is something that's important to you, you know, really research that before you book your hotel. And the last trend that I wanna share um, in the US travel industry before we open up into Q&A is that about sustainable travel. This is one I'm seeing a lot of like marketing buzz about the people in the US travel industry, whether it's airlines, whether it's rental cars, whether it's hotels, saying that they're really getting into sustainable travel. They're being green, they're being eco-conscious. But I find it's like, to me, many of these things uh, seem like ideas that came out of their like marketing groups as like ways to market stuff uh but then like if you look at their practices they're like look it didn't seem like all the things you do were sustainable sounds like you did a little tiny thing like and this is how i feel about the um plastic soap bottles in hotels you know like many hotels in the u.s have done away with the small plastic shampoo or conditioner bottles mm and instead replace them with larger bottles that stay there between guests. Those bottles are still plastic. Many of them, they still throw them away afterwards. They don't actually refill them. They still provide you plastic cups in the room. I, like there's all this stuff that's like, well, I don't, I mean, if we're really trying to be sustainable. Let me point the ways. Um, but I think that that's like, you're gonna find sustainable travel, eco green, this and that, to just be on tons of marketing material and tons of websites that you see as ways to get people to be like, oh, yeah, I wanna stay, I wanna stay at the eco green friendly hotel. Brooklyn Joe points out, uh, it's really just ways for them to save money. Right, it's a way for them to save money. It's a way, because the soap, you might take it home. You might get a few, you might take them home, cost them more money to give you those little balls of soap, cost them less money. Because uh, they got to do less work to refill those things too if they just stay there for a long time. And that is absolutely the case. Uh, ben uh, doesn't think it's a big problem if they don't make your bed. Because he says, make your own bed like you do at home. I don't have an issue making my bed. Um, but I will say, at least for me, traveling with a three-year-old, you know, we generate a lot of like towels that need to be changed. and that. I really don't need the bed to be made. But I do need new soap and new Kleenex and new toilet paper. Uh, and I don't. I don't really want to go down to the lobby to go get it. You know, I don't want to have to call somebody to get it. Like that used to be a basic hotel amenity uh, that now I pay 20% more for my room and I get even less. So uh, yay, yay me. Um, Carmen says Western Europe has issues with enough housekeepers too. Thanks for sharing that, uh, that data point, Carmen. Um, when we were in uh, Singapore, Taiwan and Japan recently, uh, we didn't encounter any of those issues in Singapore. We did encounter some of these issues in Japan too. Um, not like dirty rooms or things like that, but like offers about like, are you sure you need housekeeping? Cause if you don't need housekeeping, that'd be cool. Uh, but it wasn't the same. Like it was more like, wink, wink, can you not take it? As opposed to here where they just flat out be like, sorry, we can't clean your room. Uh, Eternal Trick says, very few hotels I've been to the last couple of years had daily housekeeping. Uh, and then Laurel says what's really important is the trash emptied. I agree. Like, I need my trash to be emptied, you know, and I don't want to, I don't want to put my trash out in the hallway. Like, hotels we have to do, that's gross, because then everybody puts their trash out in the hallway, and then the hallways are just full of trash. Um, and uh, James says hotels that uh, provide fridges should charge less. I agree. And Kel says, have you ever stayed at Drury Hotels? Which I think are big in Texas, but Kel, I have not stayed yet in a Drury Hotel. Fellow explorers, it is now Q&A time. If you've got a question, I've got an answer. All right, fellow explorers, uh, that's the state of travel in the USA. Some's recovered, some hasn't. It's Q&A time. What questions do you have? Either about the state of travel in the USA or about whatever you want to. Michael Gilroy says, Chris is way off topic, but what's the best place to eat in Hong Kong? I really like Maxim's for dim sum in the city hall in Hong Kong. One of my favorite places to eat that I try to eat every time I go there. Uh, Points Traveler says, I can't stand the communal shampoo and soap that they've stuck us with. Give back the mini soaps. I'm on board. I am working my way through my mini soaps that I've brought back from hotels and I like them. It's actually how I've gotten into 
Le Labo soaps uh, because I like, I got them in hotels, you know? So, um, James says, what's the best Halloween themed fun park in LA? I think Knott's Berry Farm does a pretty good Knott's Scary Farm. Uh, so that's my suggestion to you. If you're looking for something cheaper, um, you can check out the video I just put out. Uh, which is not LA, I guess it's it's Riverside in Redlands, California, uh, but the Live Oak Pumpkin Patch um, is like a Halloween theme park. Like it's a theme park that only comes around around Halloween. No scary stuff, mostly just pumpkins and things like that. Um, all right. Uh, Moises says, what's the best pumpkin patch in Southern California? So I think the best pumpkin patch in Southern California is Tanaka Farms in Irvine. If you are going to go to that one, you need to book your tickets in advance because they don't have enough parking. It's like an actual like farm that's a pumpkin patch. It's much more like a farm experience as opposed to a ride experience. Um, if you're looking for the ride experience, uh, Live Oak Farms that we did uh, is the biggest pumpkin patch in California. There's really more of like a fair than it is a pumpkin patch. So there are your two options on both sides of the spectrum. Alex says, when are you coming to Oregon? There are so many videos you can do. I don't know, Alex. Um, it's on my list, but just haven't made it up there yet. Uh, Canyon Overlook asks if I visited the USS Iowa and Long Beach. Not yet. Uh, you know, growing up in San Diego, I visited the USS Midway a ton uh, and visited my parents when I come to San Diego, but uh, I have not visited the USS Iowa in Long Beach. Uh, SoCal says, says farms in Irvine. Who knew? Uh, and I don't know whether that's a, like a truthful statement or a sarcasm statement, <coughs> but Irvine used to be the land of farms. Now it's all tech companies. Um, but uh, yeah, there's like Tanaka Farms. It's actually like a really cool attraction. And you might probably see my videos on like strawberry picking and they got the pumpkin patch and they do like tons of like seasonal, again, really kind of like farm focused things, sunflowers, all that stuff. Uh, Brooklyn Joe says, is there a food tour that you would recommend in LA? I've not taken any food tours in LA, um, so I don't know that I could particularly recommend one. I think a great foodie destination if you haven't been there is to, um, I think it's called Union Market in downtown LA. Like there's a main food hall in downtown LA. I think that one's pretty cool. Uh, I also, if you don't want to go to downtown LA, because it could be kind of sketchy, then I like the farmer's market that's at the Grove. Um, that one has like a ton of like really neat eateries all in this like historic 1900s farmer's market. Uh, Tim, so they're tuning late, uh, but do you feel like we're experiencing tip fatigue when you travel? Absolutely. And yes, I think I talked about tip fatigue for about five minutes. Uh, I, I am definitely experiencing tip fatigue. I am planning to do a whole like video rant complaining about, uh, tippings out of control in the USA. I just haven't done it. Carmen, uh, says the food hall in downtown LA is called Grand Central Market. Thank you very much, Carmen. I appreciate that. Emin asked if there's a famous scenic train ride in California. The most Famous scenic train ride in California is the Amtrak Pacific Surfliner um, that goes from San Diego up north uh, to Los Angeles, stops there for a little bit, and then continues on up towards uh, Santa Barbara. You get like neat coastal views. So uh, that's my recommendation for you for California scenic trains. Sid says, the best place in Germany to buy Ramoa luggage, it's called Hetzenecker, uh, like H-E-T-T-Z N-E-C-K. K-E-R, something like that. If you stick that into Google, uh, they have a couple locations in Munich, and that's where we've bought literally all of our Ramoa suitcases. That is where you're going to find Ramoa suitcases at their cheapest price anywhere in the world. I mean, unless they're stolen, but theirs aren't stolen. Um, Brandon says, I would love to see a video about tipping. All right, I'll put that on uh, higher up on my list. Franco says, Chris, is two hours enough to make a connecting flight in Dallas-Fort Worth? American Airlines is automatically booked me on this. I think you'll be okay with two hours. Um, yeah, I mean, if it's a domestic connection, not too bad. If it's an international connection, you might want three, but I think for a domestic connection, two hours is fine. James says, is there a train from Orange County near Disneyland to Universal Studios? No, kind of, maybe. There's an Amtrak station near Disneyland. It's like five minutes, five minutes, five miles from Disneyland. You would have to take an Uber uh, from Disneyland or a bus to the Amtrak station, and you could take the Amtrak station to downtown Los Angeles, and then from downtown Los Angeles, you could take the subway to Universal Studios. If you're, like, staying in a hotel near Anaheim, it's, like, a two, two hours each way. You wouldn't want to do it. Like, take an Uber. Uh, Electric Rick, my dad, says, you are beautiful. Thank you. Thank you, Dad. I, I appreciate that. Um, 
Tim says, I've just turned on notifications in hope of a tick, tip fatigue rant. All right, Tim. I'll, uh, again, I'll put that higher up on the list uh, for you, too. Uh, Tampa Travel says, I'm going to Scotland in November. Have you been? Any suggestions? We've not been to Scotland. We had a Scotland trip planned, um, but it was one right before COVID, and so that never, that never materialized. Uh, Jake says, good morning from Toronto, Italy. I just took the Bernina Express train uh, from Switzerland. The views are gorgeous, even better than the California Zephyr. All right, thank you for that scenic train ride suggestion, Jake, and thanks for tuning in from Italy. Liz says, did you say previously we're going on a cruise? We are. We are going on a Disney cruise. That's one of our upcoming trips. We are excited for that. Uh, Alex says, I'm blushing. Uh, maybe it's just the... The white balance on my uh, <laughs> the white balance on my camera. Um, Alice says I should go to iconic St Andrews, but you don't seem like much of a golf guy. I am not much of a golf guy. I like mini golf or I like pitch and putt, I like pitch and putts where you play with a putter and a nine iron. I like those things. <coughs> uh, Carmen also adds on to L A that Koreatown has some good eats. I agree. Uh, if you're looking for a really authentic Korean barbecue place in Koreatown in Los Angeles. It's called Suit Bull Jeep. Suit, like soot, like S-O-O-T, bull, like the animal, B-U-L-L, -L, Jeep, J-E-E-P. Uh, they have um, wood-burning Korean barbecue food there. Epic. It's like, uh, like LA doesn't allow wood-burning barbecue anymore, but this place has been doing it for like ever and a day, uh, and they're a Korean barbecue institution. Uh, RX says, since U.S. passport processing is 18 weeks, do you wait till yours expired or take the renewal penalty while your passbook is still valid? Um, what do you think of the ID card? I think the ID card is really worthless for most things. It's not that tremendously useful. Uh, <clears throat> and for me, I take the renewal penalty while my passport is still valid. I When we renewed our passports, OC Girl and I had to renew our passports, and then we got a new passport uh, for our daughter during COVID, since she's three and a half, we got her first passport. Uh, we paid, there's like extra money you can pay for an expedited passport. And so that's what we did. And so I think our processing time was only four to five weeks or something like that. Uh, Jake uh, loves uh, K-Town and says it feels like a little part of soul in the USA. It sure does. It's, it's legit. Um, BVTS says, do you have a favorite backpack personal item brand considering a Tumi? Uh, BVTS, I don't own any Tumi backpacks. I like, uh, I have a Jansport backpack that I travel with. It's the Jansport Odyssey 38. Um, when I carry my camera gear, I like the uh, Peak Design Everyday backpack. Uh, and OC Girl likes the her Metro Safe backpack, which is a slash proof kind of anti theft backpack. So I guess we're sort of all over on the map on backpacks. Um, but I figure I like the one. Uh, I like the ones that are more like by backpack companies rather than like luggage companies, which I guess to me is. Uh, Carmen says, I love Soup Bull Jeep. Carmen, you know your good food if you've been to Soup Bull Jeep. High five. Bah! All right. Uh, Kathy says, I got a Disney cruise in November to New Zealand. That sounds like fun. Nair Road says, do you have a favorite Hawaiian island? Yes. Next question. Oh, you probably want to know what my favorite Hawaiian island is. My favorite Hawaiian island is Oahu. Uh, I did a Oahu versus Maui versus Kauai video. Bottom line up front, we like Oahu better because we like the food. We like kind of the big city atmosphere. Um, we can go to some more remote beaches if we want to. Uh, but for us, Maui and Kauai can tend to just be a little too boring. There we go. Because we're not people that just love to sit on the beach for hours on end with an a umbrella drink in the glass. Uh, Liz says, any travel planned after the cruise? Um... We, we are ideating on it now, so we haven't planned it, uh, but we are thinking about taking a trip to Banff next year, uh, the big national park in Canada. So uh, we want to stay at the like the Fairmont hotels in the park uh, and then explore Calgary. So that's uh, that's an upcoming 2024 trip. Uh, whistleblower points out about passports that some countries won't give you a visa if the passport is expiring within six months. That's a great point. Uh, so yes, if you are looking to renew your passport, make sure it still has six months validity in it uh, before you go. James says, does everyone visiting Disneyland have to book days? Yes, uh, all Disneyland tickets are now for a specific day. Um, Newburn says, uh, I booked a trip to Sydney, Australia after watching one of your videos heading there the weekend of Thanksgiving and heading staying at the Hyatt Regency. Thank you. Awesome, Newburn. I think you'll enjoy that hotel. I really enjoyed the Hyatt Regency. I think it's got a great, uh, great location there in Darling Harbor. Um, 
Point Traveler says, I'm going to Japan next month. Looking forward to reviewing your Japan playlist. There's, you'll find hundreds of videos in there, so hopefully you find some good nuggets mm. for your trip to Japan, Point Traveler. Janelle says, uh, do not go in summer to Banff. Thank you, Janelle. That's a good tip. Um, we are planning to go probably at the end of April because <clears throat> the Fairmont hotels, the prices are like exorbitant. <laughs> and... Uh, in April, they seem to be kind of reasonable. I know it will probably be cold, uh, but that's okay. I'll take cold rather than, like, crowded uh, and super expensive. Uh, Adventure Industry says go to Universal. You know, uh, since we live in Orange County, Universal's nearby. Makes us tend to not go to it all that much. Um, but I think maybe four years ago, five years ago was the last time we went to Universal. Um, Narrow Road says, wow, Banff. Uh, nice, save up your points to stay at that Fairmont, but I look forward to the video. If you go, there will be a video. We're going to stay at both Fairmonts in the park. There's like the Banff Fairmont, and Lake Louise Fairmont, or something like that. Uh, Chase says, go to the Hot Springs in Banff. We will do that. Uh, I've heard they're there. I haven't done an amazing amount of research on it, uh, but we enjoy Hot Springs. And Travel Jack says, hi, Chris. Hi, Travel Jack. Uh, and uh, Kathy has a lot of Disney cruises coming up. Four Disney cruises in the next 12 months. That's pretty legit. Uh, B. Tangle says, how many pandas do you have? Ooh, how many pandas do I have? Well, in this studio, <laughs> how many is that? I don't know, 15, 20, uh, maybe 40 total. I have a lot of pandas. Um... Nilda says, any recommendations when visiting Miami? It's been a long time since I've been to Miami. Uh, eat the Cuban food. That's my recommendation. Uh, we also, I also did like a, um, like a thrill boat tour in the harbor that I thought was kind of fun. Um, and Alex says, it's sad to see DC losing their pandas in a couple months. Uh, it is sad to see China pulling back their pandas to China. Uh, that's a bummer. Uh, Grant Yanni says, count the panda. Guarantee this is a future giveaway question. That's a good idea, Grant. Um, it's, it's not the one today, because I'd be giving that away today. But, uh, maybe that'll be the live stream question next week. I don't know. Carmen says, it's a stuffed panda sanctuary. This is a stuffed panda sanctuary. Indeed, this is where they come for a good home. And James says, uh, regarding Banff, it's an understatement that you like hot springs. You will love it. All right, uh, James, I appreciate that. And Robert says, you must visit Chateau Lake Louise on your Banff trip. All right, we will put that on the list. Emmett says, is there some place you used to visit that you really loved that no longer exists? I'm sure there are, um, but, you know, what is it? Well, I guess right now, I mean, it no longer exists right now because it burned down, but they're rebuilding. Uh, in San Diego, one of my favorite Chinese restaurants is called China Max, and they had a big fire, and China Max burned down, uh, and it's been, like, burned down, re remodeled for the last four years or something like that. Um, I also really, um, like... I guess maybe something from my childhood that I miss today is, uh, like, video game arcades. There used to be so many more video game arcades and places you could play pinball in the USA, like, particularly, like, nickel arcades, and they're all, like, for the most part, they've all seemed to go the way of the dodo. You know, we still have Dave and & Buster's, uh, and I'm really excited that Round 1, which is a Japanese arcade and bowling chain, is opening more locations here, uh, but I really wish we had more video arcades back again. Um, cause I enjoyed my time, uh, growing up in those. BTVS, uh, says, do you still have the first panda? The first panda was stolen in London, um, which is what started the panda trend. Cause I made a video about having my panda stolen and then many, uh, of y'all, uh, sent me pandas out of the kindness of your heart. Um, and so many of these pandas that you see back here were actually, uh, they made their trip in the mail from places uh, far, far flung from California. Uh, and Alex says, I should come to Portland for the Nickel Arcades. All right, I'll put that on my list. Uh, and Sweet Shelby says, what's your favorite cruise line? We've not done many cruises. Um, so we're kind of like dipping our toe into cruises with the Disney Cruise Line. So I'll report back and let you know if I like that one. And if I do, the Disney Cruise Line will be my favorite. Uh, Grant says, have you been to Hungary? I've not been to Hungary yet. Uh, and I would like to come to Argentina, but I've not been to Argentina yet. Um, all right. Uh, and Seth says it broke my heart when you lost the original. So it broke our heart, too. 
Um, I try not to, you know, I try to be an uplifting uh, channel here, but that was one of my, um, <laughs> that was one of my sadder moments. I agree, Carmen. Uh, and Jake says, I agree with you on the arcade. Chris, glad to see these classic arcade bars are popping up across the USA. I do like that trend. You have the bars that have the video games. Um, you know, when I make my a uh, annual pilgrimage to Las Vegas later this year to shoot my what's new in Las Vegas for 2024 video, I'm definitely like, you know, allocating a few hours at the Pinball Hall of Fame, which is one of my like must stops every time I go to Vegas. Yes, it's the time you've been waiting for. It's time for the giveaway. All right, fellow explorers, it's time for the giveaway. Every video, every uh, live stream, I give away a Yellow Productions Crew shirt to somebody who can answer one of my questions. And my question to you uh, to win this shirt is, I put up a picture of a national park in the USA. What national park was that picture from? And if you were the first one to answer that question, you will win. And what I think is amazing about answering this question uh, is I... Like, I hadn't finished the answer, uh, but, you know, TL was tossing out some, uh, some answers of, like, I think it could be this, and so... And now we have a winner, winner, chicken dinner. Congratulations, TL. You must be a mind reader, because I literally didn't think about what my question was going to be until I sat here. So, are TL, are you, are you in my head? Are you in my head? You aren't in my head. Maybe you are, but either way, congratulations, TL. You win the Yellow Productions crew shirt. Send me an email to chris at yellow-productions.com and I will get one headed right over to you. If you want to pick one up and you didn't win one, head over to the Yellow Productions shop. You'll find the link in the description too. And if you wonder, Chris, when is the next live stream? Probably next week, but I don't know which day yet and time. Head over and sign up for my email list where I send you an email every time I uh, select a live stream, what the topic's going to be and what the time will be. Well, fellow explorers, it's always great hanging out with y'all. Uh, especially people like Emmett who are wearing their Yellow Productions shirt right now. That is awesome. Emmett, uh, and you know, if you're saying, Chris, how do I support the channel without buying shirts? Well, you can join the actual Yellow Productions crew. There's a join button on your screen uh, and you can help support quality content just like these super cool explorers right here. Well, folks, explorers, as usual, I won't say goodbye because I'm going to see you in the next video.